I went to my uh, uh, careers teacher, second year at university, and uh, he thought I was going to have to find a job in a few years' time. Uh, it hadn't occurred to me when I went to university that was the, in the name of the game. So I tootled down to the computer's office and uh, I looked and there were all these forms, so I took all of them and I ticked them and then I read them to all the box. I was summoned out of the careers office again and said, Mr. Stockman, we know you meant from Bailey, I'll think that you actually know quite a lot, but actually you, you've ticked things here that you'll never know anything about. Uh, marine biology. It's true, not marine biology, I, but I, I really wanted to go with the fishes. And uh, one of the other things he told me that I obviously wasn't qualified for was computing. And I ignored him on that one and ended up in a career in computing. I actually didn't knew nothing about computing. He actually, he actually recruited me, and, and, and worse than that, he promoted me later on. Um, and gave opportunities to me in my career very early on to take on projects which only a lunatic would have given somebody who had no project management experience in their life the opportunity to take on. And they worked. And it was great because you could have failed. It was one of the points that was made earlier on. Too often in the world we look for certainty. One of the things I found having come back here, this great place, it's full of talent. It's full of opportunity. I want to tell you a little bit. The title of this talk, by the way, is The Interactive World, The Fully Interactive World. Now, my premise is that over the past century, the world has put together a communications network which allows people to tell other people things. That's what communication is about. You pass a message backwards and forwards. Interaction is about you not only pass a message backwards and forwards, but you create more added value from that. You do something, you create something, an experience, an object or whatever, which wasn't there in the first place. The difference between the old telecommunications network and the IP broadband network is the broadband network is a network for interactivity. Um, I'm going to run through a few dates in a minute. I, I look up, Wikipedia is great when you're preparing to talk. You haven't got a clue what you want to talk about. Uh, we've got a few dates about the history of telecommunications. But then this morning I took, a, I took a header really and I thought, I wonder what the, I, I remember reading about Genghis Khan somewhere and how long it took to get a mail from one side of the empire to the other. I must look it up. So I looked up and found out, I found out first, Mail system, genuine mail system where they sent letters to each other was, about, was invented by the Persians. About, uh, I think it was 1500 BC. Let me get this right. Uh, I, would, I would hate to mislead you on this important point. No, 500 BC. 500 BC, first letter system. It was point to point. By the year zero, the Chinese inter introduced diverse routing. That meant your rider could go out, and when he stopped at his station, he could meet a rider who'd gone in the other direction, they kind of exchanged letters with each other, which significantly increased the reach of the network. But la pièce de résistance was Genghis Khan and Kublai Khan. They put in place a communications network across the whole of the empire, the largest empire ever in the world, which consisted of 1,400 relay stations, 50,000 horses, 6,000 boats, 500 oxen, for some reason a variable number of dogs and sheep, I can't quite work out what the sheep are at, and 2,000 carts. And at each node you could not only carry messages, you could carry people, you could carry uh, tribute, money, in other words they had ATM machines of a different sort. And you could carry goods for trade one side of the empire to the other without fear of being attacked. Has to be said that Genghis had already killed most of the people in between on the way to creating the empire, but those who survived had a really good time. Do you know that 70 to 75 percent of the world, and that's a, this population would be the same, has got the genes of Genghis Khan somewhere in their past? You too, therefore at least 75 percent of you, the other 25 percent, you're really screwed because the 75% the who are dominant alpha males and females will kill you along the way to creating a safer, better world. <laughs> From the Black Sea to Beijing, which became the empire, it took 12 days for mail or anything else to get from one point to the other. That was incredible. At the turn of the last century, it took longer for stuff to get from Beijing to the other side of the world. There was a structure, there was an organization, there was a network which had been put in place, there was an infrastructure which had been put in place. Where we are at at the moment on the globe is we have, through the creation of the IP network, the, 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 the Internet Broadband Network, um, created an infrastructure which is a platform for creativity, 
It's a platform for innovation. It's a platform for trading. And it's a platform for just enjoying yourself. If you, if you want to do stuff to just enjoy yourself. Like I did. I mean, down in Dublin and watched us beat the English at rugby. Again and again. It was great. Uh, the first thing I did when I got back home was I put iPlayer on and watched it all over again. Uh, and then I went out and bought all the papers and, and read them to make sure that it was still the same match. And uh, it was a good, a good weekend. A good weekend. The weekend's to, to, to live for. So, the idea, of, the idea that people want to interact, people get value from interaction and so forth, is not new. If one looks at telecommunications network, Telegraph was invented in 1838. First phone, 76. Things went fairly slowly from then. Um, actually, Lord Kelvin, of whom one of the networks is named after, got his lordship not for being a fantastic physicist, not for having discovered wonderful things about the theory of the universe and so forth. It was because he was a pig-headed person. And one of his tasks he'd been given was to lay a telegraph cable from the States, the first telegraph cable from the States across to the United Kingdom. I think it was either the first four or five times the cable broke. Because it's fairly heavy things the first time you do one of them. And they hadn't quite worked out the ropes. And the captain and all the investors were about to give up. But Kelvin was determined not to give up. Just because he had failed five times, that was no reason for him, for him to stop. And he went the sixth time, it worked, got connected. Queen Victoria was able to send the telegram to the President of the United States, and Lord Kelvin got his knighthood. If you're interested in knighthoods, therefore you understand that the name of the game is be really pig-headed and stubborn, spend lots of other people's money, and then take all of the credit yourself whenever it actually works. Fibre optic, first fibre optics. Now, actually, the first automatic like, dialing came in in 1960. Lots of people here won't remember key and knob systems. You won't remember having to turn the thing to make the bell ring because electricity, because the telephone network wasn't necessarily fully uh, charged up with electricity. Uh, computer networking came in 69. 1970 was a fantastic year for the communications industry. It wasn't that you had the first interconnect, intercontinental direct dialing system, because prior to that, you had to go into little boxes and book your call. And then you had to wait until a little light came on, the connection had been made, and then you were allowed to go in and speak for your five minutes and it got cut off. The most exciting thing which came out in 1970 was telephone number 746, the first colored telephone. 73, the first mobile telephone call was made. 1979 was an interesting year because it was when the f now, it was the year when the first the number of people at one moment during that year the number of people who had a commercially purchased mobile phone was one. The um, first cellular network was 79. The first no, the, the first the first network which gave the birth to the mobile phone industry. First email system was 82, and the internet was 82, 83. Two of the big moments is what's, what has created the infrastructure which is now dominant in the world. If you look at the scale of rollout of technology, one of the things one notices is in both the case of the internet and the case of mobile, these wonderful ideas, which everybody now seems blindly obvious is that it must be the greatest thing to slice bread, why did I not invent this and make loads of money? Most of the people who invented it didn't make loads of money. Back around 1995-96 in the company I worked for, one of my colleagues, actually from here, again, a very innovative, creative person, we had a good ideas scheme, and he sent in a little note and said, I think the internet's going to be really important for our company in the future, big telecommunications company. You got five pounds if it, somebody thought it was a good idea. He got a, a letter back from the chairman's office saying, and I quote, the internet will never be of any significant value to a company of the scale of ours. 2010, 30% of the world's population, 2.2 billion people, are connected to the internet. The prediction is that by the year 2014, 2015, over 50% of the world's population will have access to the internet. What that means is that over 50% of the world's population will have the ability not only to communicate, but to interact. And that's, that's a key and exciting place to be. In terms of mobile users, there's 5.5 billion mobile connections at the moment, which probably translates into three to three and a half billion 
independent mobile phone users, but that's offset by a lot of the developing countries where mobile phone is shared between different people. To the extent that mobile phones in Kenya and Zambia and so forth have got different ringtones for different people to use the same telephone, which strikes me as it's, 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 it's a sensible thing to do. So the count there is about four, four and a half billion mobile phones. All of that to say is we've created a truly interactive platform for the world. So what? Does it not? So what? What, what the real difference does it make? Um, I think if one takes a long time to begin to realize the impact of a world where the majority of people can interact with whomever they want, about whatever they want, whenever they want, then one does lack imagination. I looked at the events just in the past uh, number of weeks, the, the explosion of, of activity in North Africa. And you know, nobody 10 years ago would have predicted that mobile phone would have been a, a tool of transformation, revolutionary change in, in the separate countries. Yet that is what happened. People not, were not only able to talk with each other, but they used the fact that they were able to talk asynchronously with each other and interact to self-organize and start making change happen. The problem then is how you then come on to the next stage of being totally structured. But that dynamic world, I think, is a really exciting place to be. To bring out one of the points which is brought out in the first present out of the uh, film, it is practically impossible to predict the future. So why waste your time trying to predict the future? What you should do is, try, is spend most of your time building the future. Create a place in that future, do innovative things, do creative, do creative things. Do creative things not only to create new industries and new businesses. And I think, again, not for the first time in history, we are at a stage where everybody can become, if they've got an idea, if you're good, if you've got something that you can create, if you've got something that you can say, if you've got something that you can sell, you have access to a global value chain. The era where large multinational companies were the only ones that were allowed to play on the global stage and were allowed to access international marketplaces are gone. People in the boardrooms of large multinational companies are scared witless. One of the reasons they're scared witless is the true path to value in the future will be the ability to interact with innovative, small, web service type entities. People who are very good at something and are prepared to sell it, trade it with people anywhere else in that global space. There are lots of good examples of that in the most strange industries in Northern Ireland. For example, there's one down between Tubmore and Macaron. South Derry, in case any of you haven't gone west of the van. The centre of the universe. And they made silage covers. They've been making silage covers back since 1970, 70, 70 beginning 1980, Cunningham covers. The main market for Cunningham covers now is Saudi Arabia. Those of you who passed your geography will spot there's not much grass in Saudi Arabia. It's covering up oil equipment. Oil equipment in high temperature environments and environments where you need to make sure that the equipment doesn't get exposed to the sand and so forth so that it will continue to function whenever you actually want the drill to work. Now, that's a company whose marketplace has exploded because they have traded internationally. They took a product which they had and they were innovative in how they used it and they exploited it. Chain reaction is another great example of that in terms of, in, in terms of bicycle parts. What that says to me is that all small businesses have the opportunity in Northern Ireland to trade in the global marketplace. One of the reasons why that's the case, and Mark made mention of it earlier on, we have probably the best broadband platform in the Second decade, I remember was the first or second, second decade of the 21st century, get all the mathematics right, upon which to build our trading, our trading capability. We also have got the, one of the best platforms because it's, it's, it's ubiquitous accessibility. You can get onto that network anywhere in Northern Ireland if you really want to, but it, it provides a platform to actually deliver social change as well. Talked about education. It is criminal in Northern Ireland, with the network that we have, with the reach that we have, with the intelligence that we have, that there is over 20,000 kids who are illiterate. It's absolutely criminal. There was a quote from Diogenes, Greek philosopher of the 3rd century BC. And um, his quote, and I've read this 
in the uh, ceiling of the Library of Congress in the States. And it's really a good place when you go into the library. Don't look at the books, look at the ceiling, because that's where all the good quotes are. The education of, your ch of our children is the foundation of any state. Any state which wants to take itself seriously does not skimp on education. It may skimp on lots of other things. And by education, it's about creating creative people, people who can make things happen, people who have got the guts and balls to explore what we have and make a real difference. It's a platform where communities will take the lead. It's a platform where the role of government is not to create all the services and to create a straight checkers within which people operate, but rather to make available an open platform on the infrastructure where the citizenry can create the applications that they want to use. They can create the applications for community, that interact with each other. That it's, it's, it's a platform which allows to grow social enterprises, where, or one of the main uh, sectors will be the growth of social enterprises, where the majority of the benefit which gets created in that business goes back into the community which created it in the first place. Don't be mistaken in thinking that social enterprises aren't a path where people can make themselves rich. They absolutely can. One of the biggest social enterprises and uh, organizations in mainland UK has got a turnover, I think, of 400 million a year. As a result of the platform we have here at the minute, we have a possibility, for example, in Northern Ireland to create a creative industry production set of stages surrounding Media Village and ancillary services, which when combined with equivalent facilities in Manchester and Dublin, will make that triangle one of the premier destinations for production on the planet, digital production on the planet. It's great to be innovative, it's great to have ambition and aspiration, and it's even better if there you have energy and intolerance of things going slowly so as to make things happen. Everybody who's involved in this creative industry, good luck. I hope that was useful. You can all applaud like they did for the man on the screen at the end of the other one.